Welcome back everyone to Classic Dune and today I wanted to make a video talking about why I think that the battle wheels in Dune are the greatest combat mechanism of any board game. And that's a pretty bold claim but I think it's objectively true and here's why. The main point of all of this is how deep and expandable the battle wheels are as a mechanism and yet in spite of all that they're very elegant in the way that they go about it. So the first thing to know is that in a battle plan, there's four components. You have your dial, the number of forces that you want to sacrifice to try to win the battle. You have which leader you want to slot in to add to your strength. And then you have your weapon and your defense that you'll play weapon to kill your opponent's leader and a defense to protect your own. And then past that, the resolution of a battle just comes down to the higher total and there's no ties. So it's very simple to determine who has won the battle. Now, it's a very deep system. And honestly, the greatest part about it is that there's no randomness in the formation and execution of the battle plans whatsoever. There's no rolling a die or flipping a card. There's nothing like that. And it really means that when you're deciding what number you're going to dial or what cards you're going to play, what leaders you're going to use, you're actually able to do a lot of it based on knowledge you have and experience from past games and intuition. There's no case where it's like, well, it's a, or at least very rarely, there's a case where it's a 50-50 chance between two choices and you just randomize it and see what happens. In most cases in Dune, you're gonna have to actually think really hard about how you wanna do it. And the best part is, is that the game will actually reward you for how much thought you put into it. There's a lot of strategies and a lot of, you know, thinking about what your opponent knows about your hand and what you know about their hand. So that's a really great part. Now, what's also really cool about the combat system in this is how expandable it is, just because it has these four components to it. So if you think about the dial, the forces, that is, there's a lot of ways that the game augments this. So... A big one is you have the three types of special forces. You have the Sardaukar from the Emperor, the Cyborgs from the Ixians, and the Fedaikin from the Fremen. So these guys really shake up how you dial in a pretty interesting way. There's also the spice dialing mechanism, which is in the game if you're playing advanced. And that all really serves to make it different how you dial depending on who you are, who you're fighting, what sort of game you're having. And then you go to the leaders. There's a lot of ways the game shakes up leaders. So you have the special types of leaders that the Ikaz slash Mortani, uh, the Tleilaxu, and the Chom have. They all have special leaders that work differently uh, to different factions. And then there's also the traitor mechanic. So your leader could get called traitor. Now anyone can call it traitor, but... The Tleilaxu and the Harkonnen all have weird ways that they can shake up the traitor card mechanism. And then you've also got your weapons and defenses. Uh, that can really change depending on what's going on in a certain game. If you choose to include the sets of expansion treachery cards from expansions 1 and 3 respectively, there's a lot of really interesting things in here. You've got the Poison Blade, you've got uh, the Harass and Withdraw card all very crazy but it doesn't even stop there because you also have the Rishas who have their cache of Rishas treachery cards and there's tons of interesting combat cards in here that are really change up the way the game plays and um, and then there's even variants that you can slot in like the leader skills from expansion 2 those will change the way your leaders work you can have different abilities based on which one you play it's all very interesting and then there's the Stronghold cards. That's also a variant. They're from Expansion 2. And those also change, again, the way battles are resolved, depending on, you know, if the person you're attacking controls that Stronghold before. They have a bit of a home field advantage. So you got one for each of the Strongholds. So there's a lot of variability, a lot of uh, expandability, uh, depending on either what faction you are or who you're fighting and also what variants you're playing with. So while the base game is very elegant, it also can be 
get complicated, it can get variable, and you can have these weird battles that you've never really seen before. And that's kind of the magic of Dune, if you ask me, is that you're never really going to see two games twice, and just the same, you're never going to see two battles twice. And the great saving grace of the battle system in terms of making it, you know, there's a lot of variables, but it all comes down to really whether or not your leader survives and whether or not your opponent's leader is killed. Because those are the two biggest bearings on strength. You, of course, have your dial. You could dial anywhere from zero to how many forces you have in the territory. And you can play a leader that's anywhere from one to as high as seven. So those are your two main variables in terms of strength. So past all of the, you know, what are they voicing? What's their prescience? What weapon are they playing? What leader skill do they have? It all just comes down to how strong is your leader and do they survive? And then how much do you dial? And so it can help you to really narrow down all the things you need to think about. So if you're, for example, fighting any given battle, it can be, it can be tough to choose what you want to do if you were to be, say, emperor in this case. There's a lot of things you could think about it, but oftentimes the first thing you start with is what is a faction's maximum dial? That is, if the Tleilaxi here dialed five and played their highest leader, who in this case is Zol, which is a bit weird, but let's just say it's a four, Hidar Fenegitica. So in this case, they can reach nine at the maximum. And me as emperor, I could dial up to six and I could play my strongest leader Hazimir Fenring, who is a 6. So the Tleilaxu here could hit 9, and I could hit up to 12. Now, naturally, if we both max dial, I will have committed way too much. I'll be risking my highest leader, I'll be dialing more forces than necessary, and I'll have a 3 strength difference in how much I won by, which is pretty comfortable, but in most battles in Dune, both players are weakened pretty significantly sometimes, even if they won. The real difference between winning and losing is, do you get the spice for the dead leaders, and do you get to keep your treachery cards? Dune's a really interesting game where you're going to have to battle eventually, but when you do fight, you're both going to be blooded. It's just going to be a matter of what you gained, was it worth what you spent? And so that often creates this weird mind game in your head if you know, of course you want to win the fight, but you want to win it while dialing as little as possible. You know, I could win here and have dialed five forces, but that's not really going to be great because next turn, I'm going to only have one guy there and I'll probably have to ship more people in if someone comes to attack me. It's a really tough decision making. And so then you might say, well, let me, why don't I try dialing only one or two? But then you have to wonder, maybe the Tleilaxu have good treachery cards. Maybe they're going to be able to protect their leader and kill mine, in which case they'll win, and I'll lose all my forces anyways, and I don't even get the benefits of winning a fight where I get the spice and I keep my cards. It's a real just nail-biting, white-knuckle, just edge-of-your-seat kind of combat system that makes every fight feel like your whole game is on the line. And it's the point where, usually, other people's battles are of great importance to you you really want to pay attention to what's happening not only because it's going to be what's affecting the board state going into the next turn but you also get a sneak preview at what people have in their hand in terms of treachery cards which can be really helpful especially if you're fighting one of those factions in a later battle that turn you know if the uh if the Tleilaxu and the Ixians are fighting a battle before me I'm going to be paying close attention to what the Tleilaxu play in that battle, if anything. If they play no cards and they probably lose, then I have to wonder, well, is it because they have nothing good? Or is it because they have really good cards and they're saving them for my fight? Or if they play two decent cards and still lose, they discard them. Do I have to wonder, well, hey, did they just get unlucky and now they've got nothing left and I can win my battle very easily? Or were there was there card? Was their hand of cards just so good that that's what they were able to give away? It's very interesting, and it really always keeps you on your toes. And then, once that's all said and done, you factor in 
the different abilities, like the voice and the prescience. And it gets really interesting. There's a lot of moments for surprises, but there's also a lot of potential for being able to keep track of things, knowing what people have in their hand, being able to make intuitions on what they're going to do, and being able to win purely by kind of making mental calculations in your head, memorizing cards, and you win because maybe you say, oh, I've seen three other shields, and I have the fourth, so I know my opponent definitely doesn't have a shield, and so I can play my projectile and know with 100% certainty that I will kill their leader. Like, if you can keep all those variables in your head, and you can win a battle as a result of that information, that's honestly one of the greatest feelings in board gaming. On the other side of things, though, if you have no information at all, and you just kind of have to play something and see what happens, if it does win you the game, again, other side of the coin, one of the greatest feelings you can have when you stake it all on a 50-50 chance or even a 25% chance, and it comes out in your favor. Those, those are some of the beautiful moments in Dune. And beyond all of that, the way the game is designed, especially when it comes to combat, is all these factions feel so thematic, so rich in terms of theme, even when it doesn't involve a combat ability. Just seeing crazy events like Hazemir Fenring going up against one of the great Fremen fighters and imagining how that might have actually played out in lore, it's, it's really cool and it's really Dune. And I think that's why it makes this game so magical sometimes, and that's why it holds up. Also, one last bonus point that I can't really show here, but those battle wheels are so fun to use in real life. They're so tactile, and it's just very satisfying to use. That's going to wrap it up for this video. Uh, if you have any points I didn't really touch on about why the battle system in Dune is so great, please let me know. I think there are... No, there's a lot of games that come close to how great the battle wheels are in this game, but no game really truly surpasses them in my mind. So that's going to do it for today, and I'll catch y'all later.